Cool. Hello, and welcome to Storytelling for VR. Who's excited for this panel? All right. That's right. So we've got a short 40 minutes. We'll probably open it up to Q&A about 12 minutes towards the end. We'll have a little bong. That will be my reminder. Uh, my name is Johnny Ross. Uh, we'll smoke a bong. <laughs> that will be my reminder. <laughs> Uh, no, there will be a bong, an auditory bong, over the uh, PA system that lets us know when it's time to open it up to uh, question and answer. Uh, I cannot even begin to tell you guys how excited I am for this panel, for the collection of brains that you have in front of you right now. I'll jump right in really quick. My name's Johnny. I'm one of the co-founders of VRLA, uh, founder of the VRF, Virtual Reality Foundation, which puts on VRLA and the Proto Awards. Uh, and uh, I'm also a uh, co-founder of a startup called Visionary VR that focuses on storytelling for VR. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce first Neville Spiteri, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yes. Uh, Neville is co-founder and CEO of Weaver, formerly known as we Wemo Lab. Weaver is a pioneering virtual reality open platform to unlock content creation and publishing on VR devices. Weaver developed the blue, I don't know, uh, how many of you folks have actually seen it, but it's, it's pretty phenomenal, and the Vive version is even crazier. It's a virtual ocean experience. Uh, and uh, Neville has a, a really storied career in, in the cinematic arts. He was one of the leading 3D animation product uh, people at Maya and Wavefront Technologies as far back as 1993. He served as technical director and digital effects supervisor at Digital Domain and Square on projects like Apollo 13. Terminator 2 3D animated feature for Final Fantasy. I don't know if you guys remember that. It was kind of groundbreaking. And he served as director of product management at uh, Green Plum, now Pivotal, and was producer and senior development director at Electronic Arts. Uh, he graduated summa cum laude from Brandeis University in computer science. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Neville Spreddy. So uh, Noah Falstein over here. Uh, second from the end, uh, he's the chief game designer at Google. Uh, he was a professional game developer since 1980. He was an early hire at LucasArts, 3DO, DreamWorks Interactive. Uh, some of the titles he contributed to, Sinistar, Secret of Monkey Island 1 and 2. I played it. It was amazing. It still is. Um, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, Remission, Neuroracer. Uh, he freelanced for about 17 years on entertainment and serious games before joining Google in 2013, where he's now the chief game designer. Uh, he's been working with Project Tango, Project Cardboard Groups, as well as helping design original VR titles for the developer platform group. Please welcome Mr. Noah Faustein. <laughs> and then to my immediate left is Chris Edwards. Uh, Chris is a modest guy, but he's uh, one of a uh, few people who can stake a claim to having legitimately pioneered the process of previs. I don't know how much you guys know about previs and what that is, previsualization for movies, but almost every major Hollywood film uh, with any substantial budget uses previs to previsualize uh, 3D storyboards of absolutely everything in the movie or all of the most important parts. He is now, uh, has been for a long time, founder and CEO of the third floor previous visualization studio. Chris Edwards has helped to design many notable feature films, commercials, theme park attractions, and video game cinematics from Avatar to Gravity to several of Marvel's film franchises. The third floor continues to make its mark on the global box office. In recent years, Chris has established Hydra Entertainment to focus on story development and IP management, as well as VRC, the virtual reality company, to produce story-driven VR experiences with iconic Hollywood directors, such as Mr. Robert Stromberg, who is our next person. But uh, before we do, let's have a warm round of applause for Mr. Chris Edwards, please. <laughs> and uh, Robert Stromberg uh, is a number of things, but uh, he's a director and a founder of VRC as well with Chris. And uh, Robert is the two-time Academy Award winner for the production design on Avatar and Alice in Wonderland and the director of Disney's Maleficent, which has passed over 760 million in worldwide box office, the highest grossing directorial debut in history. No one can make a better claim to a 
better track record of creating new and imaginative worlds using the top virtual camera tools. No one is more qualified to tackle the visual challenges of designing specifically for the immersive experience for VR. Uh, we're privileged to have him on the board. Robert is one of these people who really is VR, and uh, let's give him a warm round of applause. Cool. So uh, I'm going to start with the most important question. How do we eat popcorn in, in VR? <laughs> How do we get food in our faces? So I think that's, that's what we really should spend all of our time talking about today. Um, how do how did, how did uh, I want to spend a, a brief moment because we have such a quick panel? But like, I think it's important to give a little bit of context. Like, what was everyone's sort of pre VR story? Neville, I know you've been deep into your head's been in virtual reality for a really long time. Was wondering if you could maybe start off and talk a little bit about what brought you here. Sure. The first book I read on VR was in '91. Um, it was a book called Virtual Reality. Uh, Ryan Gold book uh, for those you know, 40 and above in in the room probably remember that book. That was kind of the first time I got I got really my head around thinking about what what the future might look like when when virtual reality systems um, um, become a reality. Um, fast forward about 20 years, and you know we were one of the first companies to get access to a DK1, and it was an eye-opening moment for me because we you know really sort of connected the dots and quickly figured out that we're probably within 12 to 24 months of, of uh, having devices at a consumer price point that deliver a very compelling and comfortable VR experience. And um, I would say that the really life-changing moment for me was when I was up at, um, at Valve, um, up in Seattle in January of last year, uh, right after Steam Days, and I, I got to experience some of the early experiments and prototypes that Valve was doing. And um, I walked out of that room, nothing short of having had a spiritual experience. I really felt like I was transported somewhere else for, for 20 minutes, which went by uh, very quickly. And um, since then, it's become sort of my life mission to um, enable um, experiences, virtual reality experiences for people to enjoy. Cool. Noah, I was wondering, maybe you could give some context to chief game designer. How did, how did you go from you know, how, what was your story coming coming to sure. VR? Well, boy, um, I, so I, similarly, I've got kind of the, the double vision. I think a lot of us who have been in this a long time have our, when we were first exposed to VR and when we realized that its time has come. Uh, for mm -hmm. me, the first one was actually in, I think it was either 1984 <laughs> or 1985, that one of my friends at what was still then Lucasfilm Games had a bunch of, you know, interesting friends he called his mad scientist group and he had one of them come in to give us a demo of something that had just been on the cover of Scientific American, uh, this visual programming language. And this guy showed up with dreadlocks and he had a, a computer set up and he started to show off this visual language but to control the visual language he put on this glove and started to gesture with the glove and it was controlling the screen, which in, in 84 was just stunning. And he kept focusing on, yeah, I'm using the language and I could use these symbols to program. And we were all staring at his hand thinking this is the coolest thing we'd ever seen. And this was Jaron Lanier who uh, coined the term virtual reality and went on to do a lot of the early work. And unfortunately, a lot of us, I think, got disillusioned because the promise was, was visible even from those really early days but it's taken you know, a long time. And, and much like Neville, uh, I, I've been impressed with what I've seen over the last couple of years, but the transformative experience for me was also the vibe and, and not even so much the experience, it was when I finally took it off my head, I suddenly felt as if I had been granted superpowers for a while and didn't realize it until I was suddenly clunked back in the real world without those powers. And it was such a letdown that, you know, that was the moment that I thought, okay, this is, this is really something. So. Wow. So, Robert, um, I know we were talking earlier, I don't know how far back you want to go, but, uh, you know, you're, you're well, one of the people who have been doing this for, forever. For me, the, you know, the first time I realized there was something very special was really Avatar. And, you know, I, I'm going to just quickly point out somebody, uh, April right here. She's very unassuming, but she and I created half of Pandora through Chris Edwards. I met Chris on Avatar 
but uh, she deserves a lot of credit for that. I just want you to know. Um, so, so, so we were we were using remember back then the Intersense and, and and all these simple things, and then later on, you know, sort of uh, Autodesk and Motion Builder saved our lives. But we were it was the first time we that whole film was made in a virtual world, and we made 360. I mean, complete jungle Pandora, you know, at previous level. But those assets then went to Weta and became the real assets. But it was the first time I said, this is going to be in everybody's home. This is going to be like an amazing step. And so I kept my eye on it. And <clears throat> you know, I had to go away and, and, and do this pesky film, Maleficent. And so I lost track of the, uh, the virtual stuff for a while. But, but, but right after Maleficent, I, I think we called, um, or cold called the Oculus and said, we've got to see what you guys are doing. And we went down to their place in Irvine. And we, uh, we all had this similar experience. We came out, this is going to change things. And as a creative person and creating these worlds, it's, it's, it's like uh, you know, a dream come true for me, literally and virtually. So, <laughs> so um, you know, the first thing you learn as a pre -vis artist is never tell the director where to put the camera. And there are two types of scenes that when we pre -vis things in, in the virtual prototyping world, and it's usually either like a, you know, an elaborate car chase or series of events that all have to be done as individual moments. Or there's a big tentpole like finale scene or introductory scene that can, you can get a lot of mileage out of an event that's happening within that one virtual area. So um, what we were doing over the last 10 plus years now is building what we call master scenes of multiple actions of, of a lot of stuff animated so that it looks great from any angle you choose to shoot from. And it was always a little disappointing at the end of the day that, man, we did all this work, but we only showed 20% of it in the final edit. And we were searching for that format, the format that could allow us to show all of the, the thinking that went into this scene. And I believe, for me, the epiphany was, was the same thing, you know, the, the promise of virtual reality. And I think we have only yet to begin to explore the, the, uh, the real promise of that. So, so let's jump to then uh, what, it, what, it, what it's like to actually create film for VR, to create, to tell stories in VR. Uh, Neville, you know, uh, maybe we'll jump down the line. You know, the blue has been an experience that certainly has traveled the world and, and people have had their minds blown by. Um, what, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process and we kind of go down the line and uh, everyone could share their thoughts. Sure. So the blue is, it's an underwater experience and it's entirely computer generated. So in terms of filmmaking, you know, we're, we're primarily seeing sort of two paradigms, one in which you're in an entirely computer generated world, or in other instances, you may be using, you know, capture systems of sorts to capture aspects of, of the world. In this case, the blue is entirely computer generated. And, um, you know, we, we, we wanted to sort of deliver the sense of having an encounter with, with an underwater creature. And um, the, the, the promise that we wanted to make to everyone that experienced this is coming away with a feeling that you're, you're encountering a blue whale and being able to look at a blue whale straight in the eye. And so starting with that kind of core uh, moment, which, which, is, which is an experience that a lot of people would, would unlikely um, experience in the real world, we kind of went down the path of, of you know, thinking through what's the, right, what's the right setting in order to create a sense of place where you're having this encounter. And so from a production design perspective, one of the first sort of learnings that we had was, well, you need to represent somehow a sense of scale because once you're in virtual reality, um, introducing some elements that are familiar to the real world are quite important in order to also deliver that sense of presence. And so the first time we had you swimming in the ocean when the whale came by and the, we felt something was missing and then we introduced a shipwreck that you're standing on and so you're able to walk around the space that was equivalent to the, to the space of the ship. And the whole, the whole story changed just from, from that one um, one, one story element, which is we introduced another character, which is the ship. And it provided a sense of scale and a sense of place. And 
that was one of the sort of surprise examples of, of sort of new learnings that we're, that we're discovering in, in this new medium. Um, the second point I'll make, and then, and then we'll, we'll move on, is one remarkable thing about VR is, is, is the sense of scale that you can achieve. Um, so for example, if you're watching a movie about Godzilla, right, and you wanna be able to see Godzilla entirely in frame, the camera needs to be pretty far back. Otherwise, you won't be able to see Godzilla entirely. If the camera is right next to Godzilla's foot, you're only gonna see his feet. Whereas in VR, you, the frame's broken completely, and you can now move right up to Godzilla, and you have to literally crank your neck up to be able to see Godzilla, and you can have that experience. And literally, the act of moving, you know, shifting and tilting your head up triggers all kinds of neuronal firings in the brain and causes you to experience a whole different degree of, oh, I'm looking up at the sky or looking, and all of, all of those elements are, um, contribute highly to the, um, to the experience that you're trying to put together. So that, those were two examples. There were many along the way, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Wow, you know, my, my head is just buzzing with so many things I'd, I'd love to say about this, so I'll, I'll uh, uh, crystallize it a bit in that I, I really believe that we've been, we as human beings have been building towards VR, uh, you know, since before we were even, even humans. You know, I think that, that one of the most fundamental human things is our ability to do what we're doing now and talk to each other and by my talking, give you an idea of what was going on in my head, things that I've seen, you know, this is exactly why you are coming here to be here present, you know, go through the trouble of getting the tickets to, to get here, because there's still something about being present physically and getting that kind of face-to-face -face information that's amazing. But we've also found with modern technologies, and when I say modern, going back to early photography, that we can now create pictures or show you images as if you were there. And I, I say photography, it really goes back even 40,000 years to cave paintings. But the point being with VR, we are now at a point where we can put you in that kind of place and have not just your, you know, the feeling of your head going back, but all of our uh, hardwired things to say there's something really big next to you. And you look, and it's not just that the image is big, but your eyes are focusing, and you can tell how far away it is. That gives you these incredibly strong visceral reactions that I think is behind a lot of what we've all been experiencing. And so far, it's been, you know, this analogy has come up several times today, but I think it's a really valid one. It's like, you know, around 1900, 1902 in filmmaking where they were showing trains coming into stations, you know, or uh, experimenting with this crazy idea that maybe you didn't have to lock the camera down, you could actually cut from one place to another, maybe even show two different scenes that are happening at the same time. And we're just figuring those things out, you know, and, and just to to uh, tie in to, to my colleagues here, I'm, I'm so excited to hear what they've done. Uh, because one of the examples I give is from a friend of mine, uh, Hal Barwood, who was a filmmaker before getting into games, and he would talk about in Apollo 13 how you have shots of this space capsule with explosions happening and the view is from outside the space capsule. And nobody says, well, wait a minute, there's no camera there. How can anyone be seeing this? It's, it's part of the language of film and we understand that it's sort of a metaphor that, you know, yes, they didn't actually have to have somebody there filming it. You, the audience, get to see this sort of thing and they, they discover that then. And in a similar way, I think with Avatar, uh, the idea that we can have an incredible 3D virtual world. And yes, there's a story perhaps happening in front of you, and you may watch this several times, and the first time you see the story here, and then you're looking around, and maybe by the third or fourth time. The uh, movie Avatar had so many wonderful little details sort of hidden in the background that I remember noticing again and again. And I love to be able to have something where you turn around and you realize that that arrow that just sort of came over your, your shoulder and you know, hit somebody, you can now look around the third time through and see who fired that arrow. And maybe the fifth time, see something some animator did where there was a little uh, insect and something was about to get it when suddenly the arrow went through it. And there could be stories hidden all around you that you know, we've never been able to do before that are very much like what happens in the real world. So I'll leave it there, but so many exciting possibilities.
You know, I, I think, you know, part of the interesting thing about ex for, for directing and, and creating stories is really what's happening is we're putting ourselves in, in exposed positions. I mean, we've been so comfortable behind this sort of dark window watching other people do things. But when you put somebody in there, you're now into the sort of fear of, am I intruding? Am I supposed to be seeing this? Um, I'm supposed to be hiding. That's how you watch a movie. And so there's a lot of psychological things going on. Are you the, are you the participant? Are you uh, a character? What are you? And, and so this, uh, what I'm really f having fun with is, is, is wor and wh where do, what do you do with it? What do you do with that? What do you, where do you put the camera? Where, how, do you move the camera? We're all struggling with these same things. But what I'm finding is, is the, critical is that, uh, for instance, if, if any of you came up here and sat, you would have a different experience of this event because you would be frightened just like we are. <laughs> so, but but it's, it's all of where you are positioned. Imagine if a director on a Broadway play put you on the stage as a ghost watching them. Would you have the same experience? I don't know. I don't think you would because you'd feel like you were violating something. So it's really interesting to, and we're doing some projects where we're so, you know, working with these problems, um, and uh, we're doing a great project for for uh, one of the big studios right now. We're playing with how do you how do you cut, how do you edit, how do you come up with clever ways to do montages and dissolves and things like that. It all plays to the psychological things that we're familiar with, and um, how deep do you want to go into that scene and. If you're in the middle of a romantic thing, do you feel uncomfortable? Is it, you know? So these are all the fun things that we're all struggling with. But uh, at the same time, it's um, you know, wild west of uh, of of uh, you know, experimenting. And uh, you know, I, I tell everybody it feels like it's sort of, you know, uh, covered wagons heading west right now. Yeah. And can, that's uh, the exciting part. So can you guys talk about there? One of the reasons I, I'm excited you guys are on the panel. I don't know if it's. Uh, you know, it's not released to the public, but there's a really incredible experience uh, that VRC has created um, that for me was a really groundbreaking, groundbreaking experience to see um, for a bunch of different reasons. And I know you must have learned a lot in the process. Uh, it was a short um, okay, I'll, in your I'll first. Just, I'll just tell that whole story. It, you know, Chris, and I won't take up all the time, but, but Chris, and I, Chris and I met um, we went to after Irvine, so we got to do something. So we so we put our resources together and we made a four-minute clip uh, from a film called There that I always wanted to do, which is about a woman who uh, a man who goes into his wife's his dead wife's uh, memories and, and trying to find her. Anyways, so we did this dreamlike landscape where it's float. It's it's everything that she was put into this this strange world uh, with, no, with no physics or gravity. So you have the memories that she had are bigger and the, the, the more important memories she had were bigger than others. Long story short, we did this four minute test and, and showed it to Steven Spielberg and said, uh, just take a look. And um, I'll be honest with you, he said, well, no, I really don't want to sort of change the way films are made, so I just take a look. And so he put it on and literally was a different person. He was a little kid after that. He was so excited because of the possibilities of this. And then we were talking about we could do this and we can do that. And he could even do virtual location scouting and everything you could think of. It's an endless spiral, you know. Yeah. So anyways, I'll let Chris go. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, well, you know, at, at VRC, we're really interested in creating very highly emotional VR experiences. Not really just m moments, but strung together moments that makes for a story. And the real goal, the real aim, is to eventually get to the point soon where we can do entire movies in virtual reality, or at least with segments in virtual reality. And back to what you were saying, is that we're really excited about playing with the difference between being an observer and being an actual participant in the VR experience. And you, a lot of people say that the director has very little control over this in VR. They don't have the camera that they're used to, all those crutches that you, you originally had in the, all the history of filmmaking. But actually, we forget that you know, there's a, all these guys doing amazing theater productions that use 
blocking and lighting and sound cues and transitions of all sorts and sizes to make very emotional 360 experiences all the time before film even existed. So we're kind of, in a way, as an industry, going back to basics and just using the technology not as um, you know, the center of attention, but as the new soundstage, you know, the new sandbox for stories to be told in. And, um, and we're excited about basically that ability to control someone's um, experience in a way where it's not completely controlling, but it's sort of a guiding force, you know, uh, the ability to go into an experience and make the decision making effortlessly change the VR experience. So it's not all canned, not all just one animation, but you go in and something that you do, even though you're not clicking a button, you're not doing anything explicit, but where you look, the gaze-based decision making, how close you are to an object, how fast you react, your body movement, how does that affect the experience and how it branches into other alternatives. This is really, really, I think, exciting. Yeah, I got just one more thing. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Oh, let's oh. Uh, please finish. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at me. I guess I talk too much. Yeah. Uh, no, did, but uh, no, I, I'm gonna let you go. 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 No. No. <laughs> no. I didn't have. I'm to do it. Oh no, you guys can both talk. It's okay. Yeah. We'll just uh, do a little bit of Q and A afterwards. No, it's okay. Go. Yeah. yeah. You wanna go? No. Well, there you go. Uh, I don't I wasn't want to, I'll go if nobody wants to I was, go. I was just going to echo one, one point, which is, you know, when, when you're playing a game, um, you refer to the person playing the game as a player. Typically, when you're watching a movie, you're, you're watching, you're a viewer. And we're trying to come up with what, what's the right verb. Um, and what, one of the terms we're, we're thinking about is the notion of being a visitor. And a lot of what you were saying kind of reminded me of that. Are you, are you a are you a participating visitor? Are you a, an invisible visitor? You have to decide that yeah. up front because if you look down and don't see your body, yeah. that's a problem. If you're well, you know, it, and it's interesting because I, I think one of the things we learned in games is that there are many different solutions. You know, the, the world of games, you know, encompasses things like, you know, Tetris and Candy Crush as well as Call of Duty. And who you are and how you interact changes radically from one end to another. And my sense is that VR has, you know, certainly the same, if not much greater range as that. So I think we will have cases where you will be a participant, mm -hmm. where you'll be changing the course of it. Others, you'll simply be an observer. Sometimes the VR may set you farther back, may, may make you feel like you're actually not uh, part of the action at all. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we have all that range to play with. Cool. All right, I have a uh, hundred other questions, but just in fairness, I want to open it up to the audience. And uh, I think, you know, we've got a lot of uh, sparring folks. First hand up, let's go for it. All right, we got a microphone. Cool. Uh, love everything that you guys are doing and pushing this medium forward. So thank you very much for what you guys are doing. Um, just curious, have you guys started working with uh, viewer interactions where the media will actually ask the viewer a question, and the viewer can like nod their head yes or no, and that interaction then changes the storyline. It's not just where you're looking, but actually like natural human interactions that we would do. Have you guys played with that? Does it work at all? AI. I mean, um, I, th there's room for a lot of different things, and uh, some people want to go to a movie and sit back and watch a movie, and other people want to play games and participate. So it's kind of a cross-pollination of those two things that you're talking about. And it really, there will be those decisions made. What am I doing? Am I making a film for somebody to just enjoy? Or do I have to get involved? I'm too tired. I don't want to get involved. I just want to watch it. So these decisions will be made, um, and it's still so brand new, but from project to project, um, we'll know what type of project that is through what it's called or what it's rated or so on. So. And, and you know, with video games, we've learned that there's a really strong difference between you get to do something and you are listening to a story or observing what someone else does. And we've learned that we need to really make it clearer to the player in this case, you know, cutscenes being one of those things that, that can cause that sort of problem. And so, no, I, I haven't personally experienced that with virtual reality, but I can say from that 
previous experience that I think we're going to need extremely clear signals. Either this whole thing is something where you're deeply interacting or you're never interacting, or if not, we're going to need some way to telegraph, you know, the sudden spotlight comes down on you and it's like, uh-oh, you know, that, 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 that's going to be the time that, uh, you know, you get to make a choice. Cool. Next question. Hand up. I saw that one first. No, way back. There you go. Sorry. Or up at Stanford where they're actually looking at the effect of VR psychologically, emotionally, neurotransmitterly, whatever you want to call it. Because that, that line that you can cross to do harm, that's, I have a big concern about that. Well, one of the things that we need to do is create a rating system for VR experiences like any other medium um, has a rating system. And I, I would say that you could break it into two categories and one is just literally for the level of potential motion sickness, and another one for the level of intensity of emotional impact, you know? Um, and perhaps there, someone could come up with a standard for that. It would help in terms of just the, the psychological impact of VR. Yeah. That physical is gonna be more down to, you know, what kinds of sensing systems are on the front side of future VR helmets to allow you to occasionally see the world or maybe even dissolve on the world or some kind of a grid so you don't trip over something? Yeah, I think a, a lot of what we're trying to do too are shorts and experiences and even if we, you know, I th I've, I've often told people I think it's time to reinvent the intermission. So we'll have like uh, breaks for people and if you're doing a feature film you can go for 15 minutes and then decide if you want to keep going or you want to take a break. Mm -hmm. Um, this, as far as the psych, I mean, there are a lot of people doing psychological and medical studies on all this, and, and but we're, you know, as time goes on, we'll, right now we're just trying to do short pieces, not, try, yeah. not trying to put somebody in there for several hours. We're, we're, um, we're pushing for the standardization of the 11 minute VR episode. Mm -hmm. um, you heard it here first, <laughs> but uh, basically because you know, if you look at a full hour of television, you subtract out the commercials, it's about 44 minutes. So that divides easily into four episodes. So what we're finding is that 10 minutes or 11 minutes feels kind of like 20 minutes to a user because, um, to a participant, because it just, it's so much more tactile and, and visceral. People are seeing it like high frame rate video. And, um, you know, so it's, it's, I think it's really exciting to see what's going to happen in that regard. So. Cool. All right, right over here. I just wanted to Sorry. mention that you mm. talked about plays, that they, uh, a play which use, uses the, uh, used the, um, uh, the possibilities of VR ran in Los Angeles for nine years, from 1981 to 89, it's tomorrow. Uh, the um, uh, John Krizank, I think from Toronto, was the author of it. Uh -huh. Very interesting. You, you had uh, five basic choices, strategies that you could employ to, you know, either follow, stay, follow particular characters, follow a group of characters, yeah. respond in particular ways, and things like that. Well, that was one of the inspirations for all of us too. Is that um, I mean, it's like these pop-up groups that happen during Halloween, and some of them are running year-round, where you have the ability to go into a living, breathing play that takes place in multiple rooms and become a participant and get dragged away and reunite with your friends. And I think, that, that, I think that's very cool. And if you can allow that to happen in everyone's living room in the future without the expense of that, that would be great. Yeah, and, and I think that goes back to what I was saying about how in many ways this is really the culmination of almost every previous technology that we've used to do storytelling. And theater is, is very likely to be a major contributor. I mean, I, I, I've thought about those examples, but it even goes back to much more basic stuff. I remember being you know, probably about 10 years old and seeing a play, an amateur play, but they had people, uh, cast members who had been planted in the audience and in the first act they would pop up and, and, and that sense of things happening all around you 
incredibly involving and very much like what we're, we're suddenly able to do with technology that we were never able to do except in person before. Keep yeah, in mind. It, what's interesting too is I, 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 there's a sense of where does a game end and a story begin now and everything. So it's a crossover. You know, is a murder mystery and you're involved in it? Is that a game? Are you playing Clue or is it, you know, what? So that's what's being defined right now. Yeah, I think there, there's I going to emerge out of that some sort of subgenres of VR with certain specific names that we'll all talk about at the next VRLA, I'm sure, in the future. And, um, and people will become fans of certain subgenres where they like more of the full-on gaming, totally interactive experience. Or other folks will say, no, no, I want to be a little bit more passive, but I still want a directed storytelling experience. Other people will want to just be there with their favorite celebrity and just admire them. So, I don't know if anyone's watched Sleep No More, but one last note, it, that's a classic, classic immersive play that's a big source of inspiration for a lot of yeah, VR think, work. You know, for, for, cool. for me, I know games are, but for me, it's, uh, it's not about, uh, uh, it's not a game. For me, it's, it's about how to explore, how to use this, how to get the deepest, strongest emotion possible. And, and with VR, you're able to sort of, like I said, feel exposed and perhaps feel more involved with the situation. So when we get real actors together and let them do their thing, I think you could really, it could really be a powerful thing that hasn't been done yet. Cool. We had a hand shoot up over here that I missed before. So we'll go to the lady against the wall here on the right. There you go. Get you some exercise. Um, is that something you see a future in in the VR space, or is that something that, and what would that look like? Is that something we've lost now, or what do you think? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, yeah. I, I've, I've seen some experiments that, that people have been doing with communal VR, and I, I think, uh, you know, on the game side, you only have to look to the immense popularity of, of massively multiplayer games, and uh, for that matter, all of the streaming, you know, spectators who love to watch people playing games right now to see that there are many possibilities for VR to uh, unite the people who are watching or participating. And I, you know, really, I think the sky's the limit. It's you know, more of these variations and flavors, I think. And I think it's optimistic to think we'll have it figured out by next year. It's, uh, I think, uh, many years to come of, of revelations. But multiplayer technically has certain challenges, but we've been working on those in the game side for a long time. You know, I think very early on, we were talking about um, we, part of what we want to do is really have the ability to watch and experience something with somebody else. I think it's going to be an important part of it. A lot of times you feel alone in there, and we want to try and uh, we're exper experimenting with that as well because we want it to. We, we don't want to lose that feeling that you get when you're experiencing something with somebody that you care about. Cool. Who's next? So April, down in front. <laughs> Last question, please. I was going to ask, uh, what techniques have you guys tried with VR storytelling that you thought, oh, this, this is going to be cool, and then it utterly failed? Because <laughs> we know oh, there's a lot. April. <laughs> Come on, Chris. <clears throat> well, we tried putting a camera rig and mounted it on the front of a car and then drove around town and then watched what we shot. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't recommend it to anyone. Well, and I'll credit uh, more specifically uh, Chris Prude, who's over at Oculus, uh, gave a great talk at the Game Developers Conference about how for years in games we had learned that you do nice smooth accelerations as you move the, the point of view back and forth. And we've learned with VR it's exactly the opposite. You go to constant motion to kind of signal to the person that no, this is not you moving, this is a camera move. And I, you know, I'm sure we'll come up with other ways of, of signaling that. But yeah, ex accelerations that your body is not doing, that's not good stuff. Cool. All right, guys, let's give a gigantic round of applause <laughs> for our panelists. Hopefully some of them will stick around. Thank you very much. <laughs>